Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. So, more people. Well, it seems that uh, spiritual warfare is a good theme. <laughs> <laughs> At least you must be interested, or you must have some problems, I don't know. <laughs> so it is true that uh, we'll, we all have to, to fight in our spiritual life. And I understand that many people are interested by reflecting and spending a whole day to reflect on spiritual warfare. Because you can't have any step, you can't make any step in your life without having to fight. Spiritual growing implies necessarily to fight. We were not creating warriors. I guess when God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create Adam and Eve as warriors. Adam and Eve had to take care of the garden. They had to love one another. They have to have children. But no war at all. They were at peace. But something happened. And from this time, Adam and Eve had to give birth to warriors. And now we are warriors because we are after the first fall, after the original sin, as we say. And because of that, any step for us will be a victory. Each time you grow in your spiritual life, it's the victory you, you fought for that. If you don't fight, you don't grow. Look at the people of Israel in, in Egypt. They were in Egypt, they were slaves, and they had to leave the slavery. They had to walk in the desert and it was a big fight and they were murmuring. At the upside of these 40 days in the desert is freedom. Actually, I could have entitled this session Freedom. Freedom in the spirit. Warfare is just the downside of becoming free. If you don't fight, you remain slaves. You are slaves of your sins, you are slaves of the devil, you are slaves of the world. We have to fight in order to be free. So the upside of this theme, and I would like you from uh, the very beginning of this session to be aware of that, the upside of this theme is freedom. The question is how to become freer and freer in our life. Because Jesus created us, gave us his grace in order to be free. He set us free, free from fear. So it's not a scary theme today, because it's about freedom. <laughs> this morning, I, I checked the, the text for Mass tomorrow, and it will be an exorcism. So I, I thought it was a good text tomorrow on Sunday. The Gospel is the first exorcism of Jesus, the mi first miracle of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, when he went to the synagogue for the first time, possessed people starting to cry out. And then a man with an unclean spirit cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus then rebuked him, saying, 
be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. This is the gospel that we are going to read tomorrow, this first exorcism. An unclean spirit came out from this man. And when we speak of the belief of the devil today, we must distinguish two things. I found that in a commentary of this gospel coming from Father Cantalamesa. Most of you must know him. He is the, the official preacher in the Vatican, the preacher of the Pope. So he must be a good man, you know, to, be, to preach to the Pope every day. You must at least know your theology, especially when the Pope was, was the responsible of the doctrine. You must be sure of your doctrine. So here, this, this is a commentary of someone who knows his doctrine about what the church believes uh, about the devil. When we speak in belief of the devil, he said, we must distinguish two levels, the level of popular beliefs and the intellectual level. On the popular level, or the level of customs, our present situation is not that different from the Middle Age or the 14th and 16th centuries, sadly famous for the importance given to diabolic phenomena. There no longer are, it is true, inquisition trials, deaths at the stake of possessed, witch hunts and similar things, but practices that have the devil at the center are even more widespread than they were then and not only among the poor and popular classes. It has become a social, a commercial phenomenon of vast proportion. First thing, at the popular level, if you look around you, in your family, I'm sure there is someone who already told you, well, I have a contact with the spirits. Th strange things happened in my life. You have a tent, uh, an aunt, or you have an uncle, or you have your grandmother, Blucheria, somewhere, check out, you will find in the popular level, my grandmother, each time in the, someone was dying close to her, she heard that night three knocks, she knew that tomorrow someone will be dead. Well, it's scary. <laughs> but it's strange. I checked often, saying, speaking with the people, don't you have someone in your family who, is, who are like that with such strange gifts? Most of the time, people will say, yes. And when I was a child, I had to, to have an egg on my body when I was sick. My, my, uh, my aunt came to, uh, where does that come from? <laughs> what is this? It's the popular uh, superstition. And sometimes, through this popular superstition, uh, different spirits. Things are very different at the intellectual level, says Cantalamesa. Here the most absolute silence already reigns about the devil. The enemy no longer exists. If you look at the university now, you leave your family and you are at the university and you ask your, co your co-workers, do you believe in the devil? You're going to laugh. Bultmann, who was a famous theologian at the beginning of this century, said, one cannot make use of electric light and the radio one cannot make use of medical means and clinics in case of illness and at the same time believe in the world of spirits. You have a theologian who doesn't believe in the world of spirits. He says, I'm too intelligent for that. I believe, say Cantalamesa, that one of the reasons that many find it difficult to believe in the devil is because they look for him in books whereas the devil is not interested in books, but rather in souls. And the Pope now, Paul VI, said, dark agent, an enemy, that is the devil, evil is no longer only a deficiency, but an efficiency, a living, spiritual, perverted and perverting being, Terrible reality, mysterious and dreadful. That comes from a pope. In this realm, however, 
says Cantalame again, this crisis has not happened in vain without bearing even positive fruits. To see the devil everywhere is no less deflecting than to see him nowhere. Two extremes. And I hope that during this session we will be in the middle. Not to see the devil everywhere after the session. <laughs> if you woke up like me yesterday night at 3 o'clock a.m., you're not necessarily uh, under attacks. It can be chance. <laughs> so you don't see necessarily the devil each time there is something strange in your life. But you know that he, he doesn't sleep. If you don't sleep yourself, you think that at least there is another one who doesn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> and St. Augustine said, the devil rejoices when he is accused. More than that, he wants you to accuse him. He accepts gladly all your recrimination if this serves to dissuade you from making your confession. It's not me, the devil. I've, I don't have to have any confession. I'm just under attacks. You see, at this moment, the devil is so happy. Therefore, one understands the church prudence in discouraging the indiscriminate practice of exorcism. This afternoon, we are going to speak more about possession and exorcism. For that, you need to have an authority. You need to be in obedience. Otherwise, it becomes a chaos. I used to live in Africa, especially in Cameroon. I was in Yaoundé, Yaoundé and everybody decided to be an exorcist. <laughs> exorcist everywhere, too, too many exorcists. Our cities are full of people who make exorcism one of the many paid practices, and they boast of removing spells, the evil eye, bad luck, malignant <laughs> negativities on people, houses, enterprises, commercial activities. It is surprising that in a society such as ours, so alert to commercial frauds and willing to denounce cases of excessive credit and abuses in the exercise of a profession, many people are found willing to swallow such hoaxes. And that's true. So many people are, are looking at the, the zodiac and the horoscope. And the, the most rational people you find, the more irrational they are. Uh, from time to time. When job is finished, they become irrational. And now, after, they have to give a, a class in mathematics. But you see the same people. That day, when Jesus entered the temple, before Jesus said anything in the synagogue, the unclean spirit felt ejected and obliged to come out in the open. It was Jesus' holiness that seemed untenable for the unclean spirit. This is the key. Actually, the most important weapon won't be exorcism, won't be whatever, it will be holiness. Even before he spoke, the devil couldn't stand the holiness of Jesus. The Christian who lives in grace and is temple of the Holy Spirit bears in himself some of this holiness of Christ and it is precisely the latter which operates in the environment where he lives, a silent and effective exorcism. You see, if you are really holy, wherever you are, the devil will leave. Your house will be filled with peace. The way when you arrive in a discussion, people will feel at peace. Have you noticed some people, they arrive, the moment they are here, everybody is angry or something is, <laughs> something is wrong. <laughs> and some people, they are peacemakers. When they arrive, immediately there is kind of peace, kind of sweetness, kind of simplicity of life. So progressively we must feel that. Huh? Now, don't think that everybody is uh, possessed because uh, they are angry people. You can have an anger problem and you're not possessed. Now, what we are going to do today is to be aware of this area of our life, which is usually invisible. There are some effects, but usually we don't pay attention to the effects. We must be aware that we have to fight and to know the tactic of the enemy. 
what is the strategy of the enemy, what are our weapons, and how are we going to make it. First, I would like in this first talk to explain what are the first causes of our spiritual warfare. Don't blame always the devil. It's not the only problem. We have, according to the tradition, and today it's the feast of Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian of the church, we have three causes of spiritual warfare. You. <laughs> <laughs> not you, me, me, us. Let's say us. <laughs> Allez. I'm going to be bold, myself. <laughs> Ourselves. First cause of spiritual warfare is in us. The second cause is the world. I take the world in a very particular mean sense. You have two senses of the word world in the Bible, a positive sense, God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son, and a negative sense, when St. John said that we have to hate the world and what is in the world. So be careful, the world is also beautiful, we are not going to sing what a beautiful world, but it's also a beautiful world, but it's also the world in a pejorative sense, and here it's just the negative side of the world. And the devil. And for this first talk, I would like just to explain these uh, three aspects of spiritual warfare, three causes. Where does that come from? Why do we have to fight? The first cause is in us that somehow we are twisted. I'm sorry to tell you that, but uh, you and me, we are twisted. We are screwed up. <laughs> from the very beginning, actually from the conception, we are born with a desire to do bad things. Isn't it strange? Look at a little baby. The moment he knows how to speak, he already knows how to lie. <laughs> the moment he knows how to eat alone, he already knows how to be glutton. Why is it like that? Animals are not glutton. They eat, when it's finished, it's finished. They never have a stomach problem because they ate too much today. Uh, why do we have this? Uh, the road is like that, the, the, the road is not flat. We have an inclination to do bad things because of the original sin. And actually, the problem is that because of that, we don't do what we want to do, and we do the contrary of what we would like to do. It's very humiliating to do that. You, I want to do that, I can't. What's wrong with me? Well, you're a sinner, or you're just a human being. Let's speak Latin, because I'm sure you like Latin. Video meliora pro boque detaiora sequor. Used to say Ovid. I can see the best, but I follow the worst. It's terrible. St. Paul says that too. I'm going to read St. Paul chapter 7 in Romans. I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So be comforted because St. Paul is a saint and he says that. So. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind 
making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretch man that I am. You know, first thing is in us. The first resolution of American people for the new year is to lose weight. <laughs> it's easy to lose weight, just stop eating. <laughs> <laughs> or eat half. <laughs> you won't die, eat half. <laughs> I won't, but now <laughs> I cannot. Stop smoking, it's very easy. I, I, I tried 100 times. I, I succeeded 100 times. <laughs> Some people, that's the second resolution of American people in America, stop smoking. The third one is to make more money. But, you know, stop smoking. People say, well, it's really easy, just stop. How is it that they decide to stop and two days after, they say, well, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> We procrastinate, we are procrastinator. Say, well, maybe tomorrow. Let's have a last glass of wine tonight, and I will start to be sober, sober tomorrow. Why is it that we can't do what we want to do? Because of what we call the original sin. We were born with an original sin. Another, case, another cause of slavery, which is in us, is the fear of the look of the others. A little child doesn't pay attention to the look of the others. He is very free. When you see little children dancing before everybody, they don't care, they dance, they play. And after a while, uh, a while the, the little child discovers that people are looking at you and, well, you feel good when they look at you and they say, oh, how cute he is. And say, he knows, he, he, he has noticed it that he is cute, you know. And, he, he pays attention. You think he doesn't pay attention. He knows. And progressively, the look of the others becomes important. And this is also a case of slavery. I try to look good. I try to appear good. I try to be on top. I try to be popular. I want to be someone. And I will be someone if you look at me as if I was someone. Another case of in myself, another cause of slavery is vanity. The first one was more the flesh. The second one is more vanity, I, to appear good. And it's hell. In a certain sense, it's hell, if, because I always need the others. When people are really involved in vanity, they always need people to clap at them. If you haven't spoken about them in five minutes, they have to do something. They have to cut the conversation. They have to say something funny or notice that I'm here. You know? <laughs> they have a hard time to be in the shadow. And it could be hell. I would like to quote Jean-Paul Sartre, the French guy. You know Jean-Paul Sartre? He's not the best. Uh, he's not the father of the church. He's, a, <laughs> he's an atheist. And he used to write theater. And he wrote a very interesting play no exit. Three people are in hell, arrive in hell, Garcin, Estelle, and Ines. And they don't know each other, but they know that probably they did bad things because they are in hell. And they arrive at a nice place, a little place, uh, three, three seats, a little statue in bronze, a little chimney, and not big deal, it doesn't seem to be so, so difficult to be in hell. And uh, the only thing is that they have a neo or a light, and the light never stops. They are all, it's, there is always light, and they speak and they wonder, what the hell is that? You know? <laughs> they wonder, what is hell? Uh, <laughs> and they just realized after a while that uh, they have their eyelids removed. The only punishment, they have the eyelids removed and there is always light. They can never stop looking at each other. And progressively they discover it's horrible. Because they are sinners, so they look at each other and they accuse each other always, forever. And this is hell. At the end of the play, Jean-Paul Sartre says, 
through the mouth of Garcin. Yes, now, now is the moment. I'm looking at this thing on the mantelpiece, the statue in bronze, and I understand that I am in hell. I tell you, everything's being thought out beforehand. They knew I would stand at the fireplace stroking this statue of bronze with all those eyes intent on me, devouring me. What? Only two of you? I thought there were more, many more. So this is hell. I never have believed it. You remember all we were told about the torture chambers, the fire, the brimstone, the burning mall, old wife tales. There is no need for red hot pokers. Hell is other people. <laughs> I told you, he's not father of the church. There is another philosopher when uh, Jean-Paul Sartre acted this play for the first time in France. Another philosopher participated to the, was in the public, Marcel, uh, Gabriel Marcel. And after the play, he was interviewed by journalists and they said, what do you think about this affirmation, this statement, hell is the others? He said, well, for me, heaven is the others. But you must be redeemed for that. First, in a certain sense, we understand hell can be the others. If you look at me with hatred, if, you, if I always try to behave in my life according to what the others are going to think, this is hell. I'm not free. This is a second cause in myself. You see, we have the first thing, which is, in a certain sense, we can say flesh, vanity. And I'm going to speak now about pride or selfishness. My ego, it's always about me. I, myself, and me. The anti-trinity, trinity, trinity huh? I, myself, and me. Or me, myself, and I. I will make it by myself. I don't need anybody. Vanity is the contrary of pride. Most of the people think that vanity and pride is the same thing. Actually, vanity and pride are the opposite. Vanity, I need you. Pride, I don't need you. Vanity, I can't live if you don't look at me. Pride, I will make it by myself. Virtue is in the middle. I need you, but not in a compulsive way. I don't need in a compulsive way that you look at me, but I still need. A child needs his parents to love him and to know that they look at him in a positive way. So it's not hell, it's just to grow. But when you become obsessed by the look of the others, this is hell. Now, let's see the second cause, the word. Here I would like to quote John, because John expressed very well what is the word. Do not love the word or the things in the word. If anyone's love the word, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust of it, for he who does the will of God abides forever. John tells us exactly the same thing. What is in the world? Three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, we have spoken about eyes, the lust, the pride of life, pride. So we have the same thing in the world. The world is a big orchestration of our difficulties. We are all proud. We are all full of vanity. We are all having difficulty with the lust and flesh. And the world is going to give a wonderful orchestration, a symphony of our own problems. Hollywood, symphony of the lust of the eyes. Look at me, I am a star. I am on top. Pride, having, always having more money. Thinking that you are someone because you have something. Confusion between being and having. And obviously, needless to say that our society today emphasizes the lust. 
We are in a very particular time, and we must be aware of the time we are living. John Paul II, when he went to the United States, I guess for the first time, he wasn't even a pope at this time, he was just Karol Wojtyła. He went to the United States in uh, 1972, and he said that. It was in the New York City news at this time. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of American society or wide circles of Christian community realize, realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church. The gospel versus the anti-gospel. This confrontation lies within the plan of divine providence. It is a trial which the whole church must make up. It's unbelievable. It's, it's such a statement saying that now we are facing, well, the ultimate fight. Gospel versus anti-gospel. And he was speaking in the United States. What does that mean? What is particular with our time? People are going to say, well, you had always hurricanes uh, everywhere. So the, you had always um, killers everywhere. You had always wars everywhere in the world. Nevertheless, there are at least two things which never happened in the history of humanity since our century. 1945, the whole humanity took conscience, was aware that now we can destroy the planet. It's the first time, it's just a fact. Adam and Eve couldn't destroy the planet. They could do a lot of mess, but not destroying the planet. Now we are, by our own technique, damaging the cosmos. Well, you know, all the zone and all the, the pollution, it's a fact that now humanity is about, or is able, to kill humanity. The first time in this story. There is another thing which is the first time happening in this story. At a very deep level, for the first time, man can create a man, or wants to create another man. The first moment of conception used to belong to God alone, now, the first moment of conception is handled by humanity. We try to control what was the unique moment when God was the, the only one to give the soul to a human person, and we try to put a hand on that. This is absolutely new because this is the first covenant between God and man. With Adam and Eve, he said, be fruitful. The first covenant between God and man was the covenant in the fecundity. And now we are touching this aspect. We are touching the very first covenant between God and man. So we are facing a time which is absolutely unique. And the spiritual warfare, if it's true that we are close to the end, no wonder that the spiritual warfare now is at the highest point. Because the devil knows that his hours, his days, his years are counted. And the, the, the less he will find the opportunity to, f to, to win, the, most, the more he will try to be angry. Bishop Moroz uh, Bish from uh, Stockholm, United States, wrote recently a pastoral letter on the spiritual warfare. The occult has demonic influence. And he said, in the United States today, the occult has become much more popular than it was 20 years ago. Today, there is popular satanic music, satanic street gangs, an increase of satanic worship, a more widespread use of horoscope and study of the sign of the zodiac, and satanic games that can be purchased. In spite of this, many people do not take occult seriously. They laugh off the notion of the power of evil as actually being a part of the real world in which we live. I do believe that demonic influence is very real and that it constitutes a dangerous threat to our spiritual well-being. This is the world in which we live. I don't want to scare you, I don't want to... We have to look at that at peace, but with lucidity. The question is not to be fearful people, the question is to be lucid people. 
And now after we'll see what, what are our weapons, why we don't have to fear. But in order not to fear, it's better also to be lucid, to see the danger. So the third cause of problems and spiritual warfare is the devil himself. I, I heard a preacher in Africa, he, I knew him at least, he was an exorcist, a famous exorcist in Africa. He told me that one day he was in Senegal and he was uh, bringing back a woman uh, at home at night to avoid her to, to walk in the street alone and, and she was pretty strange, pretty weird and uh, he was driving and after a while uh, she said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, red eyes, she looked at him with red eyes, hello, I say, hello, <laughs> and he said, I'm Lucifer, and the guy was an old man, he, he, did, exorci he did exorcism all his life, so he said, please to meet you, <laughs> you know, may, may, may I help you, so he had this strange experience, you know, <laughs> please to meet you, may I introduce myself, uh, what is the devil? Is it just a joke? or If you look at the Bible, it's very clear it's not a joke, it's a fact. Take, for instance, Ephesians chapter 6. I, and Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20, for instance. It's the, the most important text about spiritual warfare. This is a very important text, a very powerful text, and I recommend it to you if you have particular problems in your life, read it, this text every day. I was advised to do it by an exorcist, the exorcist of Paris. I had someone in my family and I had a strong concern for this person and I thought that this person was really possessed. But uh, this person, I was unable to bring this person to an exorcist because he would never recognize he was possessed. So I just took a picture and I brought the picture to the exorcist in Paris and when he saw the picture he said, wow, there is no doubt. So gi give me the picture, I take it. And I will do an exorcism uh, at distance. But you, I ask you to read every day Ephesians 6. And it's amazing because after a couple of days I receive a letter from this person writing to me, I don't know what happened this week, but it's like scales leaving my eyes and I understand all the mess I've done. He didn't know about the exorcisms, the exorcism, he didn't know anything, but it's just that it was powerful. So I recommend you this text, Ephesians 6, and to read it over and over when you have problems, it's very powerful. Let's read it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle, and listen to that, is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's very clear according to, Bi to the Bible the first enemy is not from blood and flesh, it's not someone in your family, it's not your boss. It's an, you deal first in a spiritual warfare. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breast plate of righteousness and sh as shoes for your feet put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. It's amazing that in a text about spiritual warfare it speaks about peace. You have to bring the gospel of peace. There is a war but our heart is at peace. We are peacemakers and the very core of the gospel is the mystery of the Lamb not the mystery of the lion. We'll see that. To overcome the devil, we don't have to become lions. 
and all the devils. We have to become the lamb. We have to become peacemakers. Now, who is the devil? Let's, let me introduce you to him or not. Uh, <laughs> it's a joke. But according to the Bible, we have different descriptions of the devil. First one you can find in Isaiah chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down the ground, you who lay the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly on the heights of Zephon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. You see, pride. The first clue we have is the devil is a creator, a creature who is so proud. It's chapter 14 in Isaiah. Chapter 14, verse 12. Sequentes. But you are brought down to the Sheol, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. In this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made a world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who would not let his prisoners go home. All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave, like loathsome carrion. Clothed with the dead, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial, because you have destroyed your land, you have killed your people. So he's a killer. A devil actually wasn't created by God as a devil. He was created as a wonderful angel. His name was Lucifer. And Lucifer is the beautiful word. Because it looks ferus. And as you know, Latin, lux ferus is the one who carries the light. So he was the most beautiful angel. The one who was just in certain sense, just after God. The one who has enlightened the invisible world. You know that God created visible and invisible world. We say that every Sunday. When you say you create, you say that I believe that he's a creator of invisible world. So he created angels. And the most important angel, the highest angel, was Lucifer. I have a, a brother in my community. Today is the, the anniversary of his ordination. So I think about him. And when he entered, the, he, he loves words and etymology. And when he entered the novitiate, we change our name. Usually in religion, you, do, you take another name. And he really wanted to be called Lucifer. <laughs> he, he found it so beautiful. So he went to see his novice master. When you're novice, you're pretty. Uh, you have a <laughs> novitiate is a very particular time. <laughs> you don't realize you're crazy, but you are. And. Uh, <laughs> He went to see his novice master, frankly, to say, uh, yeah, I had an idea for my name, Lucifer. <laughs> so the novice master said, can you imagine me in front of your parents calling you Brother Lucifer? <laughs> <laughs> so the name is beautiful, but now don't use it anymore for baptism. <laughs> Lux Ferus, the one who carries the light. And we see here, we are going to see another text and we are going to understand why, what happened. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 and followings. Thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was you covering, carmelian, chrysolite, moonstone, beryl, onyx, and jasper, 
sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, and worked in gold were your setting and your engravings. On that day that you were created, they were prepared. So you were created in beauty. You were the most beautiful angel with an anointed cherub as guardian I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created <laughs> until iniquity was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and the guardian cherub drove you out, Michael. From among the stones of fire, your heart, and this is the key, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. You see, love of your own beauty, how good I am. Be always careful when you try when you try to think that you, well, you're not a bad guy, I'm a good person. Well, be careful. When you try to think, when you start thinking that you're really good, maybe you're in the pitfall. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. And the last text, from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2, 20. Just one verse. For long ago you broke your yoke and burst your bounds, and you said, I will not serve. Ye upon every high hill and under every green tree you bow down as a harlot. You see, I will not serve. Second clue, two sins. Your heart was proud because of your beauty, pride. I will not serve, disobedience. Why did he say to God, I will not serve? What was God's plan? There is something really interesting here. God created first angels and after he created Adam and Eve. Who is superior? Adam and Eve or the angels? Make up your mind. Who is for Adam and Eve? <laughs> no, the angels by nature are superior. By nature, angels are more intelligent, more contemplative. Adam and Eve was, were created from matter, from clay, which is not beautiful. It's dust. <laughs> for the woman, she wasn't created from clay. She's superior. The man, the male was created from clay, but she was created from the rib. <laughs> so the matter is better. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> it's just diplomacy. So what, what does that mean? That means that by nature, angels are superiors to men. But if you look at the Bible, God has a weakness. He loves always the babies. He loves always the weaker, the weakest. So in a certain sense, he wanted the angels to serve men. Look at the Bible. The older brother is always the one who is going to serve the youngest. David was the youngest. He was chosen. All the elders were not chosen. Abel and Cain. Cain was the older, the oldest. And he had to let Abel go before him. He didn't want it. He killed him. My guess is that for the devil it was exactly the same thing. He was the oldest brother. And he wanted the youngest to serve him. And God told him his plan. I would like the angels to be merciful and to serve the less perfect creature in the world. And he said, I will not serve. Now, it's a personal interpretation, actually an interpretation coming from our founder, Father Philip.
for the Mary Domingue Philippe, saying that probably the angel were saying, we won't serve this plan, because it's not logical. And God would answer, it's not logical. It's just the logic of love. But it's not the logic of justice. According to the justice, the younger, the imperfect, must serve the perfect. But now, if you are a loving person, the most perfect will serve the less perfect. And that was God's plan. And he said, I will not serve. I'm too beautiful to serve this little human. <laughs> Even when he was cast out from a possessed person, he wanted to go to pigs. You remember? He despises us. He doesn't care about us. He, wanted, he preferred to go to the swines than to the human beings. So that's the first point. Maybe we can have a pause.